and welcome to Understanding Photography with Kim Ayres, episode 160. Today we happen to be competing with the Soapbox Derby here in Castle Douglas. So people are making little go-karts of various designs and are running them down the street and it's been quite a fun affair. Unfortunately what it does mean though, while it runs straight outside our door, um, there is still quite a bit of noise going on in the background. I don't know how much of that will be coming through the window but um, I'm hoping it will be all right uh, so that's what we might be competing with meanwhile um, I'm going to be looking today at some photos I did with Annalise and Phil which have got really quite an emotional punch to them we're going to be talking about that and we've had a couple of people send in images for feedback so stick around So yes, welcome. Hi, um, this is uh, like I say, episode 160. Uh, so um, let me know where you are. If you watch, happen to be watching this live, um, then uh, let me know where you are, where in the world, what the weather's doing, all that kind of thing. Of course, don't forget to subscribe if you haven't done so already. If you're watching it on catch up. Um, there's well, the previous 159 episodes all sitting here on this YouTube channel waiting for you to to dive into. Um, but like I say, if you are watching live, then um, yes, do leave a comment. I can see we've got a few comments in already. Uh, Pat says it's cold and sunny here in Minehead. Susan says hi from a warm and sunny Kakubri. April says hello everyone from a mostly cloudy Long Island, New York. Maggie says it's sunny in Castle Douglas, and it is. Very fortunate actually the Soapbox Derby is taking place on a really nice day. Um, it's not unusual for uh, civic events and what have you for it to be chucking it down with rain and on occasion has even been cancelled because of storms. July can still be one of the wettest months of the year in, in Scotland. Um, however, uh, good day today for it. Um, Sandra says hello everyone from a sunny Birmingham. Rosemary says a soapbox starby sounds like sh such fun. Just blue skies and comfy temperatures here in Washington State. And Meg says hello everyone. <coughs> so yes, bear with me. Um, I was out there taking, watching the first run down the hill. Uh, 15 different amazing contraptions um, designed to look like all sorts of different things. Um, maybe some photos. If you, if you type in Castle Douglas Soap Dog Star, Soap Box Derby into Facebook, I'm sure you'll find uh, various images going up um, from this afternoon. I might be even putting some myself up by tomorrow. Um, right, okay, so what we're going to be talking about today is I wanted to, to, to chat about a photo shoot I did with Annalise and Phil. Oh, something else I will say first, just before as well, which is next week we still have the Cinematic Photo Challenge. So I'll also be reminding you a little bit about that uh, later in the programme. So do stick around. So, yes, the notion of working with Annalise and Phil. So some of you may remember I did a... Um, I think I put this photo up uh, last week or the week before when I was and I was talking about that notion of a sort of Wes Anderson influenced um, style of photography where Wes Anderson, a uh, movie uh, director with a very distinctive style and very, very often a lot of his styles tend to be you have everything dead center in the you know all your focus of attention is in the middle of the of, of the image it tends to shoot straight on flat on or 90 degrees to to perspective to the viewer uh, rather than weird angles and everything is very often kind of a very distinctive color scheme quite often strong pastels or even oversaturated pastel color schemes um and so when I was explaining all that, and I've used this photo a few times for that kind of demonstration. So what we have here is Annalise and Phil. I photographed Annalise uh, for the Performance Collective Stranra last summer. And uh, we started following each other on um, Facebook and Instagram and what have you. And uh, one, of the, one of the great things about working with Annalise is she's a performer. Now, most people, most of the time when I'm, I'm um, photographing people, I tend to be photographing people who are just ordinary people who don't really like being in front of the camera very much. So a huge amount of my time and, and on any shoot goes into relaxing the person in front of me, building up a relationship, building up a sense of trust um, so that they feel comfortable enough, they start to relax. Because if they don't relax in front of the camera, doesn't matter what I do with the lighting or the camera angles, if that kind of thing, it's not a good look. Sometimes I get to work with models. Now models are great because models are generally um, used to being in front of the camera. They know how to angle their body, they know how to posture um, and pose. So 
immediately we're past a great chunk of time of me having I don't have to relax them in front of the camera of course I still need to build a bit of a relationship if I want the best out of them but we can kind of shortcut that process but when you get to work with a performer there's a whole new level of uh, fun to be had again because performers really know how to project into the camera so you can go beyond just do the lines look good um, does the outfit or the situation look fine? You can actually get into projecting emotion into the lens. Emotion that isn't necessarily there to begin with or doesn't appear to, you know, it's not It's not like capturing a child as they happen to be crying. Um, well, we're performing, it's acting. And a good performer can really pull those emotions out and project them into the scene that you're then photographing. And this sort of, this so this was a quite a lot, it's, sort of opens up a whole new element of uh, possibilities. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so I was watching, um, I, was, I was following Annalise's um, Instagram post and she put up a post that looked like, it looked sort of slightly cinematic. It had been taken, I think just in the bathroom, but the way she sort of framed it and she looked at it, it sort of <coughs> looked almost like a kind of scene from a kind of gritty drama. And that set off an idea. So I got in contact with her and said, well, would she be interested in sort of having a go uh, exploring an idea of doing a photo shoot, which sort of had that kind of gritty drama element to it? And she said it would. And then she said, well, could I get, could I rope in my, my boyfriend Phil with this as well? And I said, well, that's great because, you know, the more the better, the more fun uh, we can have. So we then put, a, put together a Pinterest board, started exploring ideas and bouncing ideas about. And one of the ideas we came up with well, we had a couple of different ideas. One was to have a sort of shoot down on the beach. And actually, that's where that seawall picture that I just showed you came from. But the other was on the Pinterest. We put together a Pinterest board to share ideas, create a mood board. And one idea that came up, I can't remember who posted it, but one idea that came up, there was a picture of a woman lying in a bath at night, but she still had her clothes on, but she had running makeup. And you just thought this, this person's been through a night from hell. It was very cinematic. And I thought, well, okay, and we both kind of latched on to this as being an interesting idea. So we decided then that that would be one of our shoots. And when we, well, <laughs> so we set up that idea. What I hadn't taken into consideration was just how small Annalise and Phil's bathroom happened to be. Um, however, we weren't going to let that stop us. And we sort of did a setup and Wonderfully, Annalise and Phil were both into this and the idea was to then create a scene whereby they were both in the bath with their clothes on, but looking like they were recovering from some kind of event. And the great, the whole thing about cinematic, now I was talking about this notion of cinema last week, and it's worth keeping in mind this again if you're going to be entering the cinematic challenge for next week. And that is that notion of cinema as story through time we watch movie the movies the moving pictures because something happens before then there's a moment and then something happens afterwards now the photo is a still moment and what so we start if we start thinking well i wonder what happened before this or i wonder what happened after that then you create an image which has this sort of sense of being a moment in time and that's really important for this style of photography so let me show you a photo here um, and this then was originally what we wanted to capture so here we here we then have you've got um, Annalise and Phil in the bathroom uh, in sitting in the bath Annalise makeup running she's still wearing a dress he's wearing a, a shirt they've obviously you you kind of when you look at a photo like this you feel a strong sense of it you can feel the emotion um, uh, you don't know what's happened, why somebody would then climb into the bath with their clothes on. Presumably there's been some kind of traumatic event and then why the other person would then cl climb in to comfort them. Because comforting them was more important than worrying about whether they got their clothes wet. And so as a scene, you take a look at it and your brain can't help but start wondering, well, what happened before this or what's going to happen after this? Um, we did the shoot in the bathroom, not a lot of space in there. 
Um, I'm slightly closed in. I'll give you another shot from this one. I've kind of moved out a little bit. Annalisa's closed her eyes here. The setup, I will say, is I, I had been worrying slightly when I first turned up at the house whether we would be able, you know, how I would fit lighting into this room because this, this room was really tiny. I mean, the, the bath takes up two thirds to three quarters of the floor space. And then I'm kind of rather unceremoniously, uh, unceremoniously kind of squeezed out between the toilet and the door to try and get this shot. Um, but as it turns out, the light was coming in through the bathroom window. The bathroom window had to the frosted glass, and so it was diffusing rather nicely. And what it ends up is it looks like a kind of early morning light coming into the bathroom. Now, I, d I printed up some of these photos for Spring Fling, and I called the series Come the Morning Light, because it just feels like this is after a rather traumatic evening. What was interesting with this, though, was we'd done these photos and we thought, well, OK, I've, you know, I've got these. I'm happy with the way that they're looking. How can we mix this up a bit? What happens if she's comforting him? And when we did that and we swapped that, we ended up with this photo. And this photo just made me go, wow. Um, this photo, I have to say, I am so pleased with this in this this feels this sort of embodies this sort of sense of creating something which has an emotional impact a cinematic sense of something before something might happen after a moment in time you feel what's going on and that reverse of rather than him comforting her to her comforting him seemed to really elevate the whole mood of it we played around a bit, she, different positions, getting a, that curve of the arm as, she's, as his head's on her shoulder, coming round, his arm coming out here. And I, I like the way we've got the curve coming round here, the, the, the white of her arm here. And so the both kind of, um, the, both the heads sort of encompassed inside this sort of circle of skin here, really, <clears throat> which kind of adds to it. We've got the curve of the bath comes round, the arm stretches out. We've got this shaft of light, which I'm aware that my, my head is currently blocking, um, but on its own, it, 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 it creates this beautiful kind of shaft of soft light coming down towards them as well. And ultimately, this then for Spring Fling, this was the one that I then printed up. All the other, I did half a dozen other photos, which I then sort of had as accompanying images, but this was the one. And sometimes when you're doing a photo shoot, it depends. Sometimes you are going for a series of photos and sometimes you are after a photo. And ultimately, the a photo, the, the photo, this was the one I wanted. That's not to say that I wasn't pleased with the others and I was pleased with the others. And so I've kind of kept the others as a kind of accompanying series to go along with this. The interesting part for me with this photo, especially once I'd edited it up, through the camera, I always felt like I was onto something, but until I've really managed to get it into Photoshop, do the editing, I can never be completely sure what I've got. But then when I saw this and the final image, um, it sort of speaks to me at a level of which very few of my photos do. Each time when I go into a photo shoot, um, I've talked before about the idea that there's sort of three levels, especially if I'm working with somebody else. There's first of all, I've got to satisfy the client. Now, in this case, there isn't a client as such. This is a collaboration. I'm working with Phil and Annalise to create this image. Um, but then there's the next bit, which is I want to delight the client. So I want to really please everybody who's been involved. But then there's a level above that, which is I want to delight me. And... I always aim for in a photo shoot to delight me. And if I fall short of that, I can usually at least still delight the client. And if I fall short of that, I can still usually satisfy the client. And fortunately for me, I've never actually fallen below that level. But it's very rare I get to the point where I really delight me. I can satisfy me, I can even please me. But to delight me, that takes a new level of being able to get to. And as I improve with my photography, it gets harder and harder to reach these levels where I kind of go beyond what I was expecting. And that's what this is really. This photo here went beyond what I was hoping or could have imagined I was going to get out of the shoot. So this is, and it's also on top of that, it's kind of given me another sense of, I, I really like this idea of the powerful emotion, that sort of sense of that cinematic, where you feel like you're in a very intimate emotional moment in time. 
and it's sort of making me think that this is maybe a direction I want to go in in the future when I can, when, it, when it's possible. To show you some other photos, we, we tried a couple of other versions. Um, there was you know, other shots here, this different kind of mood again when you've got um, them sitting facing opposite each other in the bath. This is more of a kind of confrontational sense. She's looking at him, he's looking at her, but that, that whereas, you know, this is all about love and concern, this is about mm, what's going on, a little bit of reserve, hostility maybe, difficult to really tell, but there's, the, there's not that same level of warmth. Um, this was another version we did, which was one of the earlier versions, in fact, actually, I think. Um, and... It started off this was you know we, this idea of, but <laughs> Phil's looking very serious in this one and that changes the feel they've got their fingers entwined and it and the way she's resting on him has that point but he's the 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 moment that I caught with that um, it it has a different mood and feel again it always feels slightly menacing um, so. It's really strange, the same setup, subtle shifts in face position, facial glances. And this is all to do with the moment, you know, the moment that I go click. He, not necessarily that this is how his face always was. His face might have only been like this for 160th of a second, long enough for the point to go click. And it captures a moment and it changes it. We then did this one, which is, um, you know, where you're really coming in close and it is much more intimate and the, you become really you know the makeup the running makeup the closeness um the other thing to notice here is that it's, it's sort of very atmospheric there, there's you can it kind of feels you'll be i mean they're wet <laughs> in order to i will say actually at this point to get them wet um i had to pour the shower we got the shower out and i kind of squirted them with a the shower and had that the problem was to get it the, the room steamy as such um I, what I actually did was I used I've got a wee mini smoke machine and I was actually putting puffs of smoke in and that's what kind of gives the steam effect with that. Um, this was a different one. At this point, I think we've been shooting for a while. We swapped them round and they're starting to get a little bit more playful. Um, and this one kind of it starts to make me think much more how the relationship that of uh, Phil and Annalise is together, at least as I viewed it. Um, they're a beautiful couple. Um, and there's such a warmth and connection between them. Um, and then this one where it got, you know, it's kind of getting very playful. Uh, so the, these were the kind of fun shots. I mean, and to give you a sort of sense of um, the kind of behind the scenes as such, uh, Annalise uh, I took my phone and then so she, this is her photographing or me photographing her. She's photographing me on the phone. Um, and I said, when did that one go? All right, yeah, um, and that's that's me pushed up against the wall there, um, <laughs> busy taking a photo of them, and then we had to do the selfie. So this then is much more what the actual atmosphere was like in the shoot. Um, we're all having fun. It was, it was a, it was a great shoot. I really enjoyed doing it. Um, uh, Annalise and Phil were just brilliant to work with. And to, but to be able to kind of create a photo like this one doesn't come easy. It's not just a case of just setting up in a bathroom, soaking a couple of people with a shower and taking a photo. It requires a level of you know, performance and pulling the emotion out and throwing it into the scene. Um, but then it pays off as well. And the, all, the, all the combination from using the smoke machine to make it look like there's steam in the bathroom to the way the light comes through to Annalise and Phil's performance in the photos and then to the way that I was playing around with the edits because I spent a long time playing with the edits with this. So there was all sorts of directions I went in that didn't really work out until eventually I hit upon this particular edit and it wor worked. It felt right for me. So... Those were the photos I wanted to show you there. Um, it was a it was a fantastic photo shoot, and I just kind of what I really wanted to do was give you that sense of with the cinematic challenge coming up next week. Um, just really under you know, 
go for it. I mean, I'm not expecting you to come up with photos in along that. If you do, then that's brilliant. Um, but to understand that, for well, certainly for me, the kind of photos that I do can only really work in collaboration. It's not just the case of me turning around and saying, okay, you sit there, you stand there, you put your arm around him and then I'll go click. It works because they are involved and they are invested in it, not just as um, people I've employed. Um, we were collaborating to create something beyond something that either of us could have done alone. Uh, if, if they'd had a different photographer trying to set up a similar scene, they would have ended up with a different set of photos. If I'd been in the same situation but had two different people, I would have ended up with a different set of photos. Those particular photos only work because of the collaboration that was happening between the three of us. So the chemistry there um, to create that image was uh, really important. And I, th I felt, you know, given that this is called understanding photography with Kim Ayers, but it's understanding photography, is to understand that sometimes when you are photographing other people, that unless you are doing street photography or, you know, that kind of observational where you're kind of fly on the wall, uh, to create those kind of scenes, it really is about... Um, your relationship with the people you're photographing has a powerful impact on what comes up. Um, right, I can see they've got a couple of photos coming. Uh, what have we got? Oh, John's joined us. Says hello again from Columbus, Ohio. April says, great shot, Kim. Looks like a uh, photo poster for a movie. I presume that's the one where they're on the sea wall. Oh, um, Robert's joined us. Says howdy all from Texas. Susan says, I love how the curves of the bath echo those of the models. Yeah, thank you for noticing that. Uh, Maggie says, I love these landmark type photos. They are jumping off points for future work. They define the next ones. Um, yeah, and, and I, 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 that's a good point, Maggie. I, it, that, every now and again for me, <clears throat> what I find is I take a photo which is beyond is what I said earlier, you know, is, is sort of beyond what I was expecting. But sometimes you get this and what it, what these photos do is they give you a glimpse of a direction you can go in, a direction perhaps you hadn't considered. Um, there's been various points along the way where I've had photos like that. One of the first ones I ever talked about with that, some, of, some may remember, was a photo of my friend Mark where half his face is lost in shadow. Um, and that really got me into portraiture. And it was the way that photo turned out changed the direction of the way that I went in photography. Then there were other photos that I've done which have been cinematic or have been narrative of some kind, which have given me a direction and where I wanted to go. And this one now feels like one of those. They're very rare, those kind of photos. Um, so it feels quite special when they, when they turn up. Um, Pat says, the first photo inspired a tragic story in my head. Yeah, absolutely. And that's... And that's it. It's that idea of, I mean, in the end, it's performance. It's smoke and mirrors. It's, uh, you know, I've, we've set up the scene. We've decided what we're going to do. There's a camera. There's outfits. There's a venue. Lighting happened to be provided by Mother Nature in that case. Um, and a frosty window. But we, that's what we're trying to do, is we're trying to create a scene which evokes an emotion so that when the viewer looks at it, the viewer starts filling in the gaps. Um, and I think it's, it's just, ah, yeah, it's so much fun to be had there, I think. Right. So thank you to Annalise and Phil for that. Now, I, I did do another set of photos with them uh, where we were down at the beach. I've been playing around more recently. I've not had time to edit them until very recently. And only just this week have I really managed to get into that. So probably in a couple of weeks time, I will um, show those ones and talk you through some of those as well. Very different kind of feel, those ones. So, um, oh, John says uh, it's hard to imagine how cramped it would be with three to four people in a bathroom doing a shoot. <laughs> yeah, it really was. It really was. I mean, I'm absolutely squeezed up against the wall to take that photo. Um, but, uh, you know, and then I've got I've, I've, I'm on a, using a full frame camera for those who want to know the details. And I've got it on as wide as I can go, which are on my 24 to 70 mil lens. So I've got it at 24. Um, oh, Sandra also says, but says, well done for getting good photos in such a cramped place. Um, right. OK, so that reminds me then of the notion of the cinematic challenge. So 
Just a wee reminder then that next week is Cinematic Chat. So last week, if any of you need a bit of reminder, go and check back into last week's video. If you go to the YouTube, you will find in the description, um, I've got the various menu points so you can just jump into where I talk about particular crop ratios. But by and large, the shortcut is, if you think about your picture being basically about twice as wide as it is high. Now, if you want to be exact, I've put the commonly used ratios of 1 to 1.851 and 1 to 2.391. But you don't have to worry about those. If, generally speaking, you create an image that is twice as long or twice as wide as it is high, that tends to give you a more or less cinematic looking ratio. And that's kind of what I'm looking for for next week. So when we're talking about doing a cinematic photo, I want that kind of ratio. But what I would also like is for you to start thinking about that notion of a moment in time. That, that, that there, there, there is this notion that maybe something happened before this photo, or maybe something's going to happen after the photo. Now that doesn't necessarily have to involve people, but you know it could involve uh, the, the sun setting for that matter, or the way the shadow is moving across something, because there are these other ways of capturing a moment in time in a landscape or in a domestic situation, or on a street scene. But you might find things like street scenes, or um, what have you, tend to where there's people involved, or there's movement of some kind, maybe animals as well, that can allow you to sort of set up that notion of a before, a moment captured, and then implying an after. Um, a couple more comments here. Um, Oh, Meg says, was it a big space or a small space in the bathroom shoot? It was a very small space, Meg. Um, and that was part of the problem was I, I, to try and fit everything into the shot. And I'm really squeezed back against the wall to try and fit it all in. Uh, April says widescreen. Yeah, I mean, widescreen. Um, widescreen is that notion of it being, you know, well, literally it's just wider than it is tall. But um, like I say, there, there are ratios that I've put into the description of last week's um, YouTube video, which you can you can find uh, written down, or you can Google it as well. But generally speaking, if you just think, if you go for more or less, if it's 1,000 pixels high, 2,000 pixels wide. If it's 2,000 pixels high, 4,000 pixels wide. If it's 500 pixels wide, 1,000 pixels. Sorry, 500 pixels high, 1,000 pixels wide. So basically twice as wide as it is high, more or less. And then you could be a little bit in from that or a little bit out from that. But don't go drastic. If you go sort of four times wider than you are high, that's very panoramic and doesn't necessarily give you the, uh, stops it kind of being cinematic. Um, Rosemary has said, depending on your post-processing software, you might have to input 1,000 to 2391 rather than one to two. Yes, and that, that's fine. Round it to a whole number if you need to. Um, Right. OK, so that then is a sort of little bit reminder. So. Um, so next week's podcast will be that I will go through all the images that people send me. Um, I really, 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 really want you to have a go at this. Even if you don't have uh, something to go out and take, raid your archives. Again, go back, look at last week's podcast again for inspiration. I put a whole bunch of different style of photos there and showing you how why some photos would work and other ones wouldn't. But get your little kind of box square, move it around the screen, look for the story. Where's the story? Where's the narrative in any particular photo? And is it enhanced by having a wider crop? Um, and that's what you're kind of looking for. And I think you learn a lot because I know for myself when doing this that there are various photos I had which when I've suddenly got to get rid of the top or the bottom of the screen in order to get that, it changes the mood and feel of it. And the ones where it kind of enhances it, it gets quite exciting to do. So I think you will learn something from the process um, as well as, you know, hopefully we then all, if you, when we go through the photos, as always, we then become inspired by what other people are doing. And that's part of what's really important about the, this whole understanding photography with Kim Ayers bit is, yes, fine, I will tell you things, um, but it's not just about me. I think this, our, our community as such works best when, other people are inputting too. And when we see what photos other people are doing, then it inspires us. Um, that's also part then for the feedback. So let's move on to the next section, which is about feedback and critique on photos. Um, 
So uh, just a quick reminder, first of all, actually, if you are finding that these podcasts are useful, interesting, entertaining, and you would like to support them in any way, then buymeacoffee.com forward slash Kim Ayers is one of the ways you can do it. Don't forget, of course, to like this video, uh, subscribe if you haven't already to the YouTube channel and click the little notifications bell. And of course, don't forget to invite your friends as well. If you know other people who you think might be benefiting from these podcasts, drag them along, tell them all about it. So feedback section then. So what, I've got two people send in, sent in images. Uh, but just a wee reminder, the whole point of the feedback section here is this is your chance to get direct feedback on your photos. So we all have sticking points. We all have blind spots. We have photos where we go, OK, I think this is OK, or I kind of think this is OK, but I'm not sure what is wrong with it. And to be able to get somebody else to give you a good piece of positive advice on it can be can is massively, massively useful if you're wanting to advance your own photography. With all our photos, we're too close to them. I'm still coming across photos that I might have edited last week and I thought I was really happy with it. And then I've come back to it a week later and noticed something else which somebody else might have pointed out to me and I just completely missed. It happens at whatever stage you're at in photography. It never goes away. So don't think for a single moment that just because you need feedback on your photo that you're somehow less than. It's completely the opposite. If you're prepared to ask for feedback on your photo, that elevates you. That means you are taking your photography seriously enough that you're prepared to get the help to see past your own blind spots and move on to the next level. And like I say, it's an ongoing, ongoing thing. It never goes away. We practice our photography. We never finally get to a point whereby we have absolutely mastered it. Or if we do, that probably gets boring at that point. So. Send me your images. Next week, fine, we only send me the images for the cinematic challenge, but for the week after, we'll get back to doing a feedback session uh, as well. So, feedback then. Um, I've had two photos sent in. So, John Smith and uh, Robert from Texas have both sent in images. And in a way, they both, there are different things going on, but there is, there is one, there's a kind of a common thread as such, which in a way is what's the story? So what I'm going to do, first of all, is I'll show you John Smith, uh, John's image. So John sent in this one. He sent it to me last week. Actually, it's a sort of slight panic because he thought the cinematic challenge was <laughs> was last week. Um, but anyway, he, so he kind of threw this into me, um, kind of did this very panoramic. But at that point, he, he'd sent it to me. He hadn't actually watched the video talking about different ratios. So instead of this being cinematic, it feels like a much more panoramic. It's a very letterbox kind of feel. The size of this one, um, actually, I just realized I need to uh, stretch out and create the. Um, I've, I've, where's my image here? Yeah, so this is 1600 across by 451 high. So it's three and a half times wider than it is high. And that's going beyond cinematic, this. This is kind of into panoramic. Um, so in terms of cinema, not so much. But okay, what about as a photo in its own right? Uh, so I realised I should, absolutely should have put my phone on, um, <laughs> on, disturb, on do not disturb. So my, those little point pops there, um, there's a WhatsApp group which is um, giving us information on a friend who's in hospital at the moment. So constant updates on that my apologies um, so this one then from from John and whilst it creates an interesting image this sort of wide sort of sense of panoramic um, and a street scene a street scene is always a good sense there's always a sense of something going on it could change at any moment any you know you take this photo two seconds later and the person who's drinking here has maybe put their cup down. Maybe this person here who's looking at their phone is sitting up to talk to them. This person holding this cup might be putting the cup to their mouth. This person will have walked a few steps forward. This pigeon might have turned around in a different circle. This dog might have started wagging its tail, moving in a different direction. So, and of course, this person over here will have taken a few steps forward, perhaps even have walked out of the screen. Maybe somebody else will have walked into it. So there is always that sense of something moving, changing, and a street scene of some kind is very kind of interesting for doing that. However, having said that, I think the tricky bit here is 
that there isn't really you know what the question is what's the narrative what's the story what's the bit of interest that makes us want to look at make us want to linger in this photo and there's several different stories going on but none of them are kind of really joined so we have this guy over here on the right walking but he's just walking out of the picture we've got somebody here holding a shopping bag we've got people in the background but there's nothing really going on we've got this person even the people here nobody's really interacting much with anybody else now if you had at this point this person's dog was pulling on a lead to go and sort of or this person was reacting to somebody else's dog then you've got an incident, you've got a relationship, something happening between the characters that are going on. If these people over here were talking to each other or one of them was in the act of throwing their coffee over somebody else because they just had a terrible argument, um, then something would be happening. If the dogs were starting to fight in the background but they were in the scene and somebody, people were reacting to what the dogs were doing, then that would be happening. If the bag spilt open and some and, and shopping is running or there's an orange rolling across and somebody's diving to grab it, then you've got an incident. With each of these cases, you've got something happening where you're going, oh my God, what just happened? Oh, the, the, they, there's just been an argument. Oh, these dogs have just started fighting. Oh, this bag has just split. What happened on the run up to that or what are they going to do now? And that's really about back to this point of where's the narrative. And I think the tricky bit with this is that there isn't really a narrative. And even if your narrative is that nothing much is happening, I don't know that that's strong enough. And for that, what you would really need at the very least is you need a narrative composition, so an arc, lines that lead you through the photo. So you start at one end of the photo, you move through it and perhaps loop back into yourself again. But that doesn't really happen here because these people are in the shade. Probably the first person you notice is this person walking and probably then also this person walking. But these people, this person here is facing out of the thing. So your, your eye gets drawn out of the picture. If we're coming in, we come to her, but she's isolated. There's nothing, there's no leading lines either to draw us over to the people here or to draw us over to the people on the right. So basically there, John, I mean, you know, the, you're, you're onto the right idea. I think, you know, street scenes are always a good place to start. If you're going for a cinematic crop, like I say, twice as wide as you are high rather than three and a half times as wide as you are high. So just think a ratio of two to one is your quick shortcut. If you want to know the absolute, like I say, there are, in fact, actually, Rosemary's just re-put them inside the comments here. But you can also go back and check the last podcast or you can Google it if you want to get exact ratios. Um, but primarily, you need to have a sense of something happening. So I hope that kind of um, gives you a sense there, John, that, you know, just taking a photo of a scene is one is a starting point. But you need to maybe wait for something else to happen or zoom in on something or start to anticipate. Trying to do street scenes is a notoriously difficult, um, very, it's got a very low hit rate, you know. You can take a lot of photos which don't quite work to get the one that does. So anyway, I hope that gives you some ideas there and of course to everybody else watching. But thank you for sending that one in. OK, next up then, what I want to do is I want to take a look at Robert. So Robert sent me this one and he said, I took this picture at Yosem Yosemite National Park last April. Uh, the location is where Ansel Adams took the pictures of El Capitan and the dome. So for anybody who's ever studied a bit of photography, if you know, if you've ever heard of Ansel Adams, if you haven't, go and look him up. There, these, there are these classic photos of Yosemite Park, pretty much this scene. Um, and they are, they became absolutely iconic. So iconic that they've now built a car park and a viewing platform so that everybody can go there to take this photo. And of course, this is exactly what Robert did. So Robert says he went there, took this photo, fired off half a million shots or close enough uh, to try and get the shot. He said, as I was walking back to the car, I thought a shot of the people would be really interesting. 
I think it's something to see. I also think the cinematic prop works really well too. So Robert here has created, he uh, he's done a close to, so he's, he's done more of the, I think it's a, uh, 1 to 1.778 so it's the same size as your computer screen so 1980 by um, no, sorry, 1920 by 1080 ratio on a computer screen so like a normal widescreen tv or your computer screen this is the same kind of crop as that um, he said uh, so I he said I submitted this photo to the Dallas Camera Club in black and white and I'm hoping that it does well so Robert was looking for a bit of feedback on this one and but he's given us the color one rather than the black and white version and actually to be honest I did try and play to play around with a couple of black and white but I think if you, what you're talking about is the people in the shot when you go black and white you kind of lose them somewhat um, I mean if I just open this with Photoshop for a moment you'll see what I mean that um, of course obviously it kind of depends on the way you've converted to black and white but what you've got here is you've got a very very dominant landscape it's a huge landscape let me just um, change that workspace to here and but what you're saying is what you're what you're interested in is the fact that you've got the people taking a look at the landscape and if I convert this to black and white almost however I do it but let's just do a quick um, uh okay black and white here turn it to black and white then the landscape dominates and you kind of lose the people somewhat um and even if i sort of try and boost some of the colors maybe some of the reds take the reds up to kind of get a bit more out of the jackets perhaps um blues that playing around with the background a little bit more it's a fairly dull down day but what happens is we're not getting as much about the people as we are when you've got when you're in color all these red and orange and yellow jackets leap out at you and your eye gets drawn to them first so you then become much more aware of the fact that it's people in the landscape rather than this looks more like a landscape photo which happened to capture people who got in the way of it and there's a you know quite a distinctive difference if you've got landscape photo with people in it or you've got people or there's a with like this is much more about the people and our interaction with the landscape so I don't you didn't send me the black and white copy that you've put in for the Dallas Camera Club so I can't assess that uh, here on the podcast um, but my, my instinct for this is that there's a probably a good chance that the color version would have more of the narrative you were seeking if you're talking about the fact that what you've so you have stood there you've gone off to the um, You've gone and stood here where we can see all these cameras and people and you've and you've and the waterfall and you've you've done all this yourself. You've taken your version of the photo, but then you've come back and you've seen actually what makes this an interesting photo is the fact that everybody's there. Because when you just take the landscape, you're just aware of this huge landscape. And when we look at that Ansel Adams um, photo, it's just this massive landscape and it looks so we feel puny humans, nature, raw powerful huge dominating and you get the feeling from his photo that he's on his own the only person in the world seeing this view and then when you look at the photo you are seeing the view as he saw it and then you've taken your bunch of photos and every single person here who's taking this photo is trying to recapture that sense except for the fact of the lie of the fact that there are dozens if not hundreds of other people there around the same time all trying to take exactly the same view so I think the narrative idea is quite a good one, which is let's not just get the view, which everybody's getting. Let's face it, everybody's getting exactly the same view because everybody's standing in the same viewpoint. Um, the only thing that's going to change is the weather. And the fact that the clouds are moving all the time means that, again, when you take the photo from one minute to the next, the, the light will have changed subtly as well. But that aside, everybody's essentially got the same view. So what you're trying to do is say is, is make a comment on that. Where it falls down, where I would say, hmm, how would you improve on this? I think the thing is with this is what you've got here is that's a broad narrative, but there are potentially more interesting narratives. If you're talking about the people in the photo taking the photo, then there are different stories within here. And this is what really captured me. And when I start looking in, so if we come to here, this part of the photo, for example, I really like where we've got the cameras on the stands we've got you know the 
the either uh, whether they're professional or they're serious amateurs who've got big bits of kit this person here has got obviously one of these great big lenses on their on their camera we've got all these fancy tripods this tripod has camouflage on it so this is obviously somebody who takes himself a bit seriously fancy camera bags here um, all bits of extra equipment kicking around sitting on here this this guy so here we've got you know this sort of sense of other people there with our big fancy camera equipment to take a photo of what he, you know and then probably within that if you've got something like that we're capturing the waterfall and you get the waterfall and you get the people and you get the camera if we move over here a bit we're into a different realm here we have a couple of people who look like they're probably looking at their phone chances are one of them saying hey did you see what i capture what do you think of this one right got another person which looks like a tripod here and then we've got people who are just actually enjoying the view, not taking the photo. As we move over here, we now have this person's clearly take using their phone. This person here is speaking on their phone. <laughs> I must admit that one made me laugh because there are so many people who are standing with their phones out taking photos on their phone. Now you forget that actually phones can be used as phones as well. This one here, we've got somebody sitting on a wall. Chances are they're actually getting their photo taken with the background. Although at the angle they're at, the backdrop is mostly going to just be a bit of cloud and mist. Um, this one here, again, looks like we've probably got, I mean, the fact that she's smiling and holding a rather worried looking baby um, means that chances are mother here is taking taking a photo of possibly her mum and, and baby with um, incredible backdrop. As well so actually what we've got here I think there's a whole bunch of really interesting stories within that which is how people go about photographing the landscape you see your narrative here is here's the amazing classic landscape and here's a whole bunch of people photographing it and that's an interesting narrative but I for me for my for my money's worth what I really like is the idea of how people are photographing and how they are interacting with it and what the differences are. So whether you've got this, um, sorry, zoomed in too far there, you know, the, I'm having the, the, the selfie or the, the picture with the background in it, whether you've got people just chatting away on the phone or people doing their own phone photos or hanging around. You've got also the people with their sort of professional or semi-professional equipment. Over here, um, that person's just looking at their phone as well. Here's somebody else getting bringing up their phone ready to get ready. Here's somebody here. Again, they've got look like they've got a camera rather than a phone being pushed over. Here, oh, this looks like somebody with a kind of graduation type photo kind of going on here. And we've got um, that looking presumably at this person here who's using her phone to take a photo of them. Whereas this one here is shooting out that way. And he seems to be looking over his shoulder towards this woman here and it's these little stories Robert I think these stories are the fascinating bit and I would suggest that if you found yourself back here again or in a similar kind of situation whereby what you've got is a whole bunch of people photographing the same thing yes fine get the big scene but as a big scene there what we don't have is at this distance when we're taking in the whole photo all these people along here just end up as a line of figures and it's, it's OK. I mean, it's, it's still an interesting one. Line of figures against the landscape rather than just the landscape on its own. But I think there are so many stories within that of how people are interacting with the landscape and their phone that, you know, you, you could have easily spent, you know, just spent five minutes just sort of sitting there zoomed in and taken uh, photos of different groups of people and how they're interacting. I think you could have ended up with quite an interesting set of images. So really, that's kind of what I wanted to say with that. So with both the last one and with this one, the, the key points are really are about narrative. What's the story you're trying to get and what can you do to enhance that story? And in the case of John, you're really needing some kind of element of action of happening. And with this, there's lots of little actions of happening, but we don't see them until we zoom in. Um, and when it's only this big, and I mean this big on my computer screen, 
isn't big enough to really see what's going on. And if anybody's watching this on a smaller tablet or even a phone, they really won't see anything apart from a tiny little line of red and orange jackets to know that there are people there. Which again, like I say, even, and even that gets lost if you put that into black and white. So hopefully then that gives you a few thoughts there, Robert, to, to sort of play around with. Um, look for the stories within the story as well. Um, and I think that that will give you a whole new playground. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that kind of right. I can see we've got a couple, another couple of uh, comments here. So um, let's see what we've got. Uh, boom, boom, boom. Um, OK, uh, Robert said, as someone who loves street photography, I completely agree. So that's Robert commenting on the one for, about John. Uh, April now says beautiful shot, but I would go to that park in the summer. Um, April is too cold. I love the clouds, but I do love the clouds in the photo. And yeah, I mean, I, I suppose if you're going to Yosemite, you know, summer good weather is, is, is nice. But then maybe you get miss the drama. I mean, you know, a clear blue sky and, you know, two o'clock in the afternoon maybe isn't going to be as dramatic as, you know, this kind of dark brooding clouds. Um, Pat says excellent idea to take the people to do the people watching. Um, Sandra says great location I would love to go there Rob Meg says incredible photo Robert April says a lot of red and orange people um, red and orange people are wearing that is interesting to me that does not happen all the time I think it does one of the although it does if you're in the the, the fraternity of people who um, who do hill walking or go out into the landscape a lot if you sort of buying yourself one of these all weatherproof coats and weatherproof trousers it's because you're going hill walking or mountain hiking or anything like that then very often these things tend to be bright red and bright orange and and what have you um partly it's a survival thing so that if you happen to get lost um or fall down the cliffside and break your leg then the rescuers can find you more easily if you happen to be wearing a bolder colour. So you tend to find there's a lot of people do hill walking in Scotland. And so that kind of notion of the, the bright red and orange jackets, I think, is, is relatively common here. Probably less so in um, Long Island, New York, though. Less, less need for, for it. <laughs> uh, Susan says, great image, Robert, but I think the colour version has more impact and tells more of a story. Maggie says, I like the bright jacket colours juxtaposed with the amazing natural landscape. April also says, I, I know Maggie, the red and orange and yellows really pop out. Robert says, thanks for the feedback. I think I have a few shots of some people interacting with the landscape. I will see what I can do with them. Um, and he's also agreed now that the black and white is not necessarily the right feel for this shot. John says, I think it would also be difficult to think. I think it would, would be difficult to think about a people shot with that magnificent landscape in front of you. Yeah, and I think that's that's an interesting point, John, which is basically where your brain goes. Um, and if you especially if you are more of a landscape photographer, you just see the landscape and that's where your head goes. You just see the landscape and you avoid getting in the people uh, because people are just going to mess it up. But, you know, and in that way, I think that was a good call on Robert to actually turn around and notice and recognise that it wasn't just about the landscape or that there was another narrative going on. I mean, yes, he's already taken his five million photos of um the landscape but there's another narrative going on so yeah absolutely kudos and um, smug points to you for, there for for recognizing that as an opportunity um as well um and uh oh yeah april says no that's true kim i usually go hiking in the warm sunny weather where it is not needed yes <laughs> Right. OK, well, so thank you then, Robert, and thank you to John for sending in the images. I hope you found those feed bits of feedback useful. So to uh, just a quick reminder then that if you are finding these um, podcasts useful, entertaining or interesting and you would like to support them, then buymeacoffee.com forward slash Kim Ayres is one of the ways you can do it. So next week, then next week is the cinematic challenge. So I told you all about it last week. If you need a reminder or you weren't here last week, then go and watch episode 159, where I go into much more detail about the kind of photos and how you can get create much more cinematic images. Full with this idea, I want you to submit your images. Go for it. If you don't, if you're not going out to take fresh images, then raid your archives. Go back to your folders and say, what? have a think. What would make a really good image that is roughly about twice as long as it is high? And what would make it cinematic? What will have that notion of narrative? What will have that notion of a moment in time, a moment that something's happening before it or something's going to happen after it and that you are observing something? 
that and so that the viewer can't help themselves but start filling in the gaps can't help but start to create a narrative of what led up to that moment or what's going to happen afterwards so that's your challenge send me your images either put them in the facebook group understanding photography with kim Ayers, um, or email them to me kim at kim uh, tell me a little bit about the photo as well tell me what was going on why you created it why you chose it or any interesting little bits and pieces of information about it because that's also interesting as well when we go through these photos next week um, there's always this sort of fun I, I it enhances it if we have a little bit of story behind the photo as well so get those images into me as soon as possible. Definitely try to get them in by Friday. Saturday, you're kind of pushing it. I mean, really, if, you know, but definitely by Sunday is too late. But, you know, depending on how many we get in. Um, if we get a lot in, then it will be the earlier ones that I will uh, prioritise. So that's pretty much much us then um thank you to everybody who's uh thank you to robert and to john for sending in image thank you to all who've been making comments and um and leaving comments and uh, interacting and uh look forward to seeing you all next week i can't wait to see your images take care bye bye